Hello everyone, just wondering if you can hear me all right. Great, looks like you can, so um, let's get started. Hello, I am here in person. So welcome everyone to today's webinar on virtual CT colonoscopy. I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping with you. So you can see at the top of the screen that there's a button that says raise your hand. If you could try not to use this, please, because um, I won't be able to answer you during the presentation and it just gets a bit distracting. So there'll be an opportunity to answer questions at the end of the presentation. And also there'll be some documents that you can download um, at the end. So I'll let you know when that's happening. I'm just going to stop my webcam while I present because it just distracts me. So after this uh, course, you should be able to understand the background of CTC, understand the patient preparation, understand how to perform the examination and how to post process. So the agenda will talk about those uh, four sections. So the background, so bowel cancer is a general term for a cancer that starts in the large bowel and it's sometimes called colon or rectal cancer. In the UK, we have 40,000 new cases diagnosed every year and one in 20 people will develop bowel cancer in their lifetime. The risk factors include age, Almost 9 in 10 cases of bowel cancer occur in people aged over 60. Diet, a diet high in red or processed meats and low in fibre can increase your risk of bowel cancer. Weight, bowel cancer is more common in people who are overweight or obese. Exercise, being inactive increases the risk of getting bowel cancer. And alcohol and smoking. If you have a high alcohol intake and smoking, this may increase your chances of getting bowel cancer. There's also a link to family history. So having a close relative, like a mother, father, brother or sister, who developed bowel cancer under the age of 50, puts you at a greater lifetime risk of developing the condition. Some people have an increased risk of bowel cancer because they have another condition that affects the bowel, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis cause inflammation in the bowel. The three main symptoms of bowel cancer are blood in the stools, a change in bowel habit, such as frequent looser stools and abdominal pain. These symptoms are very common, however. Blood in the stools is usually caused by hemorrhoids and a change of bowel habit or abdominal pain is often the result of something you've eaten. These symptoms are very common. In the UK, an estimated 7 million people have blood in their stools each year but the majority of these people don't have bowel cancer. As the vast majority of people with bowel cancer are over the age of 60, these symptoms are more important as people get older. Also, these symptoms are more significant if they persist in spite of simple treatments. Most patients with bowel cancer present with one of the following symptom combinations. A persistent change in bowel habit with blood in the stools. A persistent change in bowel habit without blood in the stools but with abdominal pain. Or blood in the stools without any other hemorrhoid symptoms such as soreness, discomfort, pain, itching or a lump 
or abdominal pain, discomfort or bloating that's always provoked by eating, sometimes resulting in a reduction of the amount of food being eaten and weight loss. The symptoms of bowel cancer can be subtle and don't necessarily make you feel ill. This slide shows us two world maps. The left map shows the incidence rates of colon cancer in a number of cases per 100,000 population. And the right hand map shows the amount of red meat consumed in grams per day. As you can see, in the UK, we're in the red section, which means on average, we consume less than 60 grams of meat a day and the incidence of colon cancer is 41 in 100,000 population. Interestingly, in Ireland and France, the red meat consumption is higher at more than 60 grams a day, but the incidence of colon cancer remains at 41. Also, countries like Brazil and Mongolia are eating a lot of meat but have low rates of cancer. The three documents shown on this slide you'll be able to download at the end of the presentation and I'll also give you some web links to them. The first one is a very detailed document dealing with the use of CT colonography for all patients where colon cancer is suspected. It works in conjunction with cancer screening guidelines. The second document is the main policy that is the alternative imaging technique of choice when colonoscopy can't be achieved. Barium enema should not be performed as a first line alternative to colonoscopy. The third document was published in 2010 by David Burling, who was also instrumental in writing the guidelines for the NHS bowel cancer screening programme. So the tests that we have available in the UK are the occult faecal blood test. This is posted out to everyone between the ages of 60 and 74 every two years. We have bowel scope screening, so sigmoidoscopy, similar to colonoscopy, but this only studies the lower part of the colon, i.e. the sigmoid and rectum. Bowel scope screening is gradually being introduced in England from March 2015 and about two thirds of screening centres offer this test as a one off to 55 year olds. Barium enema is the traditional radiological test to look at the colon and CT colonography has become the radiological method of choice for the NHS bowel cancer screening programme for patients who are unable to have or have an incomplete colonoscopy. This slide shows the patient's feedback and compliance of the various tests and we can clearly see that CT colonoscopy, virtual colonoscopy, uh, has green faces on both compliance and feedback, so the patients clearly prefer this test. So let's move on to patient preparation. It's really important that the bowel is as clean and dry as possible. Different sites will have different techniques for achieving this. But generally, bowel prep can be split into three different sections. A low fiber diet, so this would be you give the patients a diet to follow in the days leading up to the exam. Things they shouldn't eat before the exam is things like fish with a high fat content, so herrings or kippers, red meat, milk or high fat dairy products, fruit and vegetables, or rye and whole grain products. You can use bowel cleansing. So as I said previously, it's really important that the bowel is as clean and dry as possible. 
and we'll talk about bowel cleansing in the following slides. Also, some sites may give drugs, such as buscopan, to stop movement in the bowel. These can have some side effects, such as constipation, dry mouth, and nausea. Buscopan does have some contraindications, such as myasthenia gravis and megacolon. So you should always fill out a safety questionnaire um, before giving that. So why do we need to prep the bowel? So solids or liquids in the bowel can hide or lead to the underestimation of lesions. Patient discomfort. So if you leave the bowel unprepped and the bowel has feces in it, inflating it with air or CO2 is going to get very uncomfortable. We need the test to be as accurate as possible and it needs to represent the colon without any faecal matter in it. So how do we achieve that? Generally, you can give some drug therapy and diet, and we'll talk about this in the next slides. So why is bowel prep important? If we don't properly prep the bowel, there could be remaining solid or liquid compounds in the bowel. A leftover solid compound can mimic a, a pseudo polyp, and that's a polyp that's not really present, um, and it could just be fecal matter that looks like a polyp. Liquid compounds could potentially mask a, a real lesion, and it's also important to do more than one view, so a supinum prone or perhaps a decubitus view. Um, this is in order to change the view of the colon. So by doing that, the liquid or solid compound will move and it will be easier to diagnose the images. So the diet that you should give leading up to the uh, scan is really important. A lot of centres ask that three days prior to the exam, that the patients don't eat fruit, veg, milk products, red meat or cereals. One day prior to the exam, only liquid food should be given, like clear soups. And the day of the exam, it should be complete fasting other than certain drinks. The patients need to keep drinking water to keep hydrated because this can be a problem. So how do we generally cleanse the bowel? There are two ways. We have a complete cleansing, which is the traditional method, or a partial cleansing with fluid or fecal tagging. The traditional method would be um, having the diet that we just discussed, and then also using a strong laxative to cleanse the bowel. Partial cleansing would involve following the diet and faecal tagging also. I'm going to talk more about that in the coming slides. So if you're using a traditional prep, there are two main options on what to use. We have a wet or a dry prep. Polyethylene glycol is wet prep. You may know it as its uh, brand name of Miralax or Glycolax. It has some pros and cons. So it's good in the fact that it doesn't affect the hydroelectric balance, electrolytic balance, um, which may cause elderly patients to dehydrate. So it's generally safer for elderly patients. The colon is left wet in relation to the fact that fluid can be left in the colon after this prep. With this kind of prep, any luminal liquid will move easily when the patient changes into the prone view. So arguably, you get better discrimination of small polyps compa compared to sodium phosphate, which is the dry prep. The cons of uh, PEG prep are some people are hypersensitive to it, can have allergies. 
it can cause colon stasis or dynamic ileus, megacolon, acute colitis, and it can also cause nausea and bloating. So sodium phosphate is a dry prep. People generally have a higher tolerance towards this, so they're not on the toilet for as long, which is great. And there's less drugs to take. However, the cons of doing this is there is sometimes residual fecal matter on the bowel wall. So not everything has been expelled necessarily. And as a result of this, it can be hard to distinguish small polyps. You can, it can also cause hyperphosphatremia. Sorry, I'm not quite sure how to say that word. And hypernatremia. It affects the hydroelectrolytic balance and can cause dehydration. And it can't be used with people who have renal problems. So people who are at risk may have to have lab exams pre and post treatment. So what are the alternatives? Um, much more commonly in my experience is fecal tagging. So how does it work? Some studies recommend using barium. Some use gastrographin based contrast and some use a combination. So fecal tagging. If fecal matter is left in the colon, it's going to be highlighted or tagged by the watered down barium and have an increased density. This is done so it's easier to differentiate between fecal matter and a polyp. Or you could use fluid tagging with an iodine based contrast agent. So this is usually gastrographin. Using the colon VCAR software, we can digitally cleanse the colon and remove that um, fecal tagging. So you can see from this slide that there are many more pros to fecal tagging than there are cons. And this is probably the reason why it's the most commonly used today. Some sites may give drugs such as buscopan to stop movement in the bowel. It's usually given right before the scan and prior to the gas insufflation. As I mentioned before, it can have some side effects, side effects such as constipation, dry mouth and nausea. And it does have some contraindications such as myasthenia gravis and megacolon. So you should always give a safety questionnaire. There are some alternatives that you can give um, and the doctors will know what these are. So how do we actually perform the examination? For the patient position for insertion of the tube, they should be lying on their left side, so left lateral decubitus, and also the tube should be lubricated for obvious reasons. You should insert a cannula, so this is so that you can give buscopan or contrast, or if the patient has a reaction to the contrast or buscopan. But in the UK, we tend to give contrast for quite a lot of the colon patients. So once you have the tube inserted, um, you need to distend the colon. So it's much more common to use carbon dioxide than air to distend the bowel as it's easier for the body to reabsorb. So it's deemed that CO2 is more comfortable for the patient. It's less costly and causes less pain for the patient during and after the exam. So once you've got the bowel inflated, you need to do the uh, scouts. So we generally do the supine scouts first. Usually the first scout is um, 
in the supine position and it's AP, you need to do an AP and a lateral scout in order to see how distended the colon is. So the way GE scanners work, they always modulate the MA using the last scout that you've taken. So that's usually the lateral one. So it's very important that you have this well centered in the gantry. And on this slide, you can see that the distended, um, the descending colon isn't that well extended. So I think I'd be tempted to add a bit more CO2 at this point. Once you've got the bowel extent, uh, fully inflated, you can move on to the supine acquisition. So this slide just shows you some example parameters. And these are going to depend on the quality of the scan that you want. Most sites will do a higher dose supine followed by a lower dose prone scan. The slice thickness is 1.25. These are usually recommended so that you've got less images to load into colon VCAR. And generally, the polyps that we're trying to detect are three millimeters or above. So you're not going to gain much by doing 0.625 millimeter slices. So after that, we'd move the patient round into the prone position and take the prone scouts. So as the patient turns over, the air is going to move around and the colon will change position. So it's important that you check these scouts and make sure that the colon is still sufficiently distended. If it's not, you could add more gas at this point and you could also get the patient to lie on a pillow placed just underneath the rib cage to take the pressure off the transverse colon and get it to open up more. So the prone acquisition is generally lower dose than the supine acquisition. And we want to keep the dose as low as possible. So there are a number of ways to optimize the scan and keep it low dose. The coverage and ODM. So sometimes on the first supine scan, you may be using contrast and need to scan the whole liver. But most of the time, you can keep your scan range very tight to the top and bottom of the colon. So only scan what needs to be scanned. Be aware of the purple z-axis tracking lines on the scan because this is showing you the area that is actually being irradiated. So in order to make the first and last slice, the scanner needs to have enough information. So it scans slightly further away. This is called overranging, and it's, it's a normal thing in helical scanning. So where possible, you can use organ dose modulation if you've got this feature on your scanner just to cover the overranging part and put it over any radiosensitive organs on the front of the patient. You can use um, 100 kV if possible in smaller patients because they don't need as much penetrating power. And MA, you can use a manual MA or use a modulated MA with a lower cap top end so that the dose never goes above, for example, 250, 300 MA, and have a higher noise index to drive the dose down lower. When you're thinking of um, the scan field of view, choose a scan field of view that matches the size of the patient. So for normal size people, use large body scan field of view. For very small patients, if they're less than 30 centimeters in diameter, you can use the small body scan field of view. Make sure that the patient is in the isocenter, and you can do this by clicking a grid on the lateral scout to make sure the scout is properly penetrated, and this will allow for good dose modulation calculations to take place. 
you can also alter the amount of ASA or ASA B. Um, the more of that you put on, the better the image quality. So you can keep the dose quite low. So we have a few image quality considerations. So things that can degrade the images are um, movement. So try and ensure the patients are as comfortable as possible in the position they're in on the table. Use buscapan to stop the bowels going into spasm. And this will make insufflation more comfortable. Make sure you coach the patients on breathing. So you can um, make sure that the language is set to the correct language that they know and that they, they're aware of the you know, props, if necessary, the breath hold lights um, or instructional videos that are on the scanner gantry display. So you can get artifacts um, from things like catheter bags or um, not having the arms above the head. So just make sure that you've got arms above the head and, and nothing sort of dangling off the edge of the table. Hip replacements also, they can be quite tricky to deal with. Um, but if you've got a GSI scanner, you could put GSI Maron, metal artifact reduction, or smart mark can be used if, if your scanner has that feature. So let's move on to post-processing. So the GE software that we use to post-process colons is called Colon VCAR EC. And everybody asks, what is colon VCAR? What does VCAR stand for? It means computer, sorry, it means volume computer assisted reading. And digital contrast agent or DCA can be added to highlight spherical anatomical regions over a set size. So that will highlight the polyps for you. The EC stands for electronic cleansing. So colon VCAR has certain benefits for the patient in terms of the fact that the whole exam is more comfortable with less stress and it's less invasive than colonoscopy. The exam is generally quicker and no sedation is required. So it's, uh, it has quite a few benefits for the patient. The features of the software include a synchronized fly through, 360 degree dissection view, automatic colon segmentation, DCA or digital contrast agent, digital cleansing, virtual biopsy, and it has some measurement tools and a reporting tool. So this is what the synchronized fly through looks like in the reporting software. What you need to do is bookmark polyps on the supine and prone view and then link them together. So once these have been linked, the software co-registers and links the prone and supine data sets as well as the polyps and then everything will move in synchronization with each other. The dissection view is a view that um, you get and what it does, it's like it can also be called the fillet view. Um, the grey area on the edge is where you have a 45 degree overlap and you can move through the sections of bowel using the little arrow on the sides. The digital contrast agent can be placed on any view just by pressing the D key on the keyboard. 
and anything that's in red on here you can change just by clicking over it. Digital contrast agent, what that does, it automatically detects and highlights on all the views any suspicious shapes characteristic of polyps. So these shapes are displayed as overlaid color highlights and you can set the DCA sensitivity preferences using um, the slider panel on the left control panel in the software. Most people detect polyps above three millimeters. Electronic cleansing is a digital subtraction of the oral contrast media. So after electronic cleansing is applied, then the wall of the colon behind the contrast material becomes visible and available for, for examination. You can set the threshold as well for different um, thresholds um, just by clicking over the red annotation. The virtual biopsy tool can be displayed over an area within the navigator view, allowing you to review the density of the tissues with a color biopsy or a grayscale biopsy, black and white biopsy. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you're using this software, there are a number of keyboard shortcuts that you can use and um, they're all listed here. So the minus key will turn off the DCA, turn on or off the DCA on all viewports. The F key will move forwards, the B key will move backwards, H will hide the uh, bookmark, T turns around so you could be going from uh, cecum to rectum or rectum to cecum, D key will turn on the DCA, the C key hides the 3D cursor, the S key will save an image, and then the insert key inserts a bookmark, you can delete these bookmarks, and shift and click the mouse will bring your 3D cursor into the centre of where you want to look at. Um, this slide is just showing you that on GE Cares, there is a very good video tutorial of how colon VCAR actually works. So I'd recommend you have a look at that. So those are the links on the side here. This top link is the link to the video tutorial and the bottom link is a link to all of the quick guides for all of the softwares. So we'll move on to questions and answers now if anybody's got any questions just type in the question box. And I'm just going to put up a question and answer page. And I'd appreciate any feedback. These files, you can download them. So those are the um, quick guides and the guidelines that we discussed earlier. So if you want to download, just click on any of those. These links in the notes section are 
links to these documents as well, online links. Okay, has anyone got any questions? Okay, I've just got a question about the weight limit for this test. Um, I think the weight limit is going to be determined by the weight limit of the CT scanner and if the patient can physically fit through the scanner. Um, obviously, it's really difficult on some patients to include all of the anatomy and what I re recommend is that you just use as many straps as you can to try and keep all of the um, abdomen sort of enclosed within the straps. Um, if they need to be decubitus, then yeah, that's that's an option as well. I've had another question here on patients if they haven't had the oral contrast, should the test still go ahead? Um, now, I think that's going to be a clinical decision by the radiologist. So um, depending on what your site policy is, um, I have known sites to go ahead without the oral contrast. Um, and after a failed colonoscopy, you could you know, give some oral contrast and then wait for a couple of hours and then do the test. But um, yeah, that's that's going to be a clinical decision. Okay, if that's all, um, I'd really appreciate it if you could um, just answer these questions. So if you're viewing in a group, if you could type in um, the names of the people so that I can send them certificates. And if there are any topics that you'd particularly like to hear about in the future, if you could just write them down here and any feedback for me would be great. So if you want to download any of the documents, you can download them from this, this page here.
Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to close the meeting. But um, if you need to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me through your GE Cares account just by clicking on um, contact a GE expert and you should be able to um, book some time in my diary if you want me to do an online session with you or you can ask questions through GE Cares as well.